Good morning. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you especially to our young people who've uh, led our music and uh, our intercessions. Uh, some of them have already gone out, so make sure you thank them when you see them afterwards. Now, we, uh, these, this term, we've been looking at the topic of relationships, and that series, uh, we, we're drawing to the end of that uh, series now. Um, and I wonder, some of you know what I'm going to be talking about today, or you think you do, and um, I wonder what you're hoping that I'm going to say or not say today. I sent around uh, some little videos with, about some specific Bible passages which I've hoped which I hope you've had a time to, look at, time to look at. But this morning, I'm mainly going to tell you a story. It's, it's a story about a father, primarily about a father, and it's inspired by a story which Jesus told. Um, it's one, it, it, the story Jesus told comes in a set of three stories, and Jesus introduced them with these words. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this story. In fact, there were three stories. So this is my story. It's inspired by one of those stories. It's not the same as Jesus' story, but perhaps it's the kind of story which Jesus might tell if he were here today. There was a father who had two daughters. If you met the daughters, you might not guess that they had the same father. They looked different, and they looked at the world differently. I'll come to the older daughter later, but let's start with the younger daughter. She was frustrated by life at home, by its time-tested rhythms and roles which she viewed as constraints. She found it difficult to live up to what she felt were the expectations others had of her. To settle down, to marry a boy from the town, to serve in her father's house. She wasn't sure that any of those things were for her, and especially not the marrying a boy bit. She felt as if she were wired differently from the people around her, including her sister. Often she wished that wasn't the case, how much easier it would be if she shared their orientations and passions. She tried to knuckle down, to go out with nice boys, but it never worked out. It made her miserable, and it made others miserable. Perhaps she should have spoken to her father about this, but she didn't fancy that conversation. It would surely be easier to avoid the awkwardness altogether by distancing herself from her father, her family, and her home. So, one day, she said to her father, give me my share of the estate. Her father was sad, but he was a gracious man, and he knew that his daughter had reached an age where she needed to make her own choices. So, at considerable cost to his emotions, as well as his retirement plans, he divided his property and gave the younger daughter her share. Not long after... She bundled together all she had and set off for the city. Her father drove her to the station, waved her off, asked her to stay in touch, dried his eyes, and hoped she would be okay. And oh my, did she feel okay. She certainly didn't have the time or inclination to message her father. She was having way too high a time. She met people who seemed like her who urged her to see her passions and orientations, which in the past had felt like a constraint and a burden, as instead an opportunity, an invitation to experiment and explore, not to be tamed, but indulged. The scene, the scene she got involved with was wild and seemingly free, and, and so why would she ever think of home, yet alone going home? Why would she want to talk to her father about what she felt? She laughed now at the thought of his old-fashioned ways. Her life in the city, however, had a cost. It was not a cost which the daughter at first took much notice of or was even aware of. Perhaps she deliberately shut her eyes to it, but there was a cost, and it wasn't primarily a financial cost. 
When she'd arrived in the city, she'd been comparatively well off. She'd been healthy in mind and body. Most importantly, she'd come with a relationship with her father, which she now realized, although it hadn't been everything it could or should have been, it had been something. It and the things which went with it had given her something she'd now lost. Things like security, purpose, unconditional love. So now, far away from home, in the crowds of the city, in all the hookups and letdowns, she felt gradually more lonely and lost. And as she was feeling this lostness within, a storm also hit the world around her. It could have been one of various things, a pandemic, a war in a nearby country, a cost of living crisis, or perhaps all those things came together. And this perfect storm compounded her inner needs. She resorted to things which even her new acquaintances would have regarded as shameful. And as she sat at her screen, watching images of people doing things in ever more bizarre and unnatural ways, she realized that the longings she'd experienced back in her hometown was something she felt even more strongly now. A longing which her lifestyle in the city had deadened but not satisfied. A longing for what? Not primarily for bodily contact, but for intimacy with someone who was totally for her, for unconditional acceptance, for committed sharing of life in all its ups and downs, she tried to satisfy her own yearnings, but nothing she tried gave her anything that satisfied. The daughter had spent months pushing her father and her father's house into a distant corner of her mind. But in her extremity, something of her home life attracted her. Coming to her senses, she said, how many in my hometown, not just in my family, but among my father's workers and friends, have something I don't have, have experience of some intimacy and community that I don't know here. Here I am, lost and alone. I will set out and go back to my father. It was a courageous decision. And as she traveled, she wondered what kind of reception she might receive. She knew her father well enough to know that he would not approve of what she'd been doing all these months. Her father lived by a set of values derived from time immemorial, revealed from heaven. They were intrinsic to all of her father's life, to all of life in her father's house, to how they lived and how they related to each other. They were values and relationships which were integrated within a shared story, a wondrous story, a story of an eternal unity between heaven and earth, which had once been broken, but had also been and was still being and would one day be gloriously restored. A story of hope and a future. A story of hope and a future in eternal union with God, a story of another father and his child who willingly sacrificed their own intimacy that others might be brought into intimacy with them. And as she thought about that story and those values in her father's house and the destiny that story proclaimed, the daughter knew that her behavior in the city would have been to her father a source of shame, a tawdry second best, something which would, if it were known to the father, surely separate them. For she had, by dishonoring her father and indulging, indulging her own preferences, she knew she had sinned. Her father could surely only look at her in her dejected state and affirm that she had received already her due penalty. Surely there could be no blessing left for one like her, who'd squandered her inheritance in wild living. So she resolved to say these words to her father. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your child. 
Make me like one of your hired servants. So picture the scene as the girl returns home. As she approaches her hometown, what is going to happen? How awkward is it going to be? Will there be a place for her? Or will she end up retracing her steps to the city? While she was still a long way off, her father saw her. Because, you see, he had daily been on the lookout for her and was filled with compassion for her. He ran to his daughter, threw his arms round her and kissed her. His daughter said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your child. Make me... But before she could get any further, the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on her. Put a ring on her finger and sandals on her feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this child of mine was dead and is alive again. She was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Let's not rush too quickly from this scene. Let's wait here a moment and savor the wonder of what has just taken place. The daughter who has rejected her father and all that he stood for has returned empty and ashamed and has been embraced. The daughter who has grasped and squandered and forfeited her inheritance is given the best goods in her father's house. The daughter who was lost has been found and has been welcomed with a party. The daughter who sinned and recognized that sin has been greeted with compassion. Hold that scene in your mind. Bind it on your hearts. Tell it to your children. But all this time, we have been neglecting the older sister. I mentioned that the two daughters were quite different from one another. The older sister had always been happy to be in her father's house, engaged in her father's business. She had been horrified at her sister's behavior towards her father, disgusted at the reports she would heard of her life in the city, and felt that it would be altogether for the best if her younger sister stayed away permanently. Her sister was as good as dead to her. So when, unaware of her sister's return, she came near the house and heard music playing and dancing happening, she was immediately anxious. On being told what was happening, how her sister had returned, the fattened calf had been killed, a party was being given, her anxiety turned to anger. She refused to go into the house. Even her father could not persuade her. And when he tried, a pent-up flow of bitterness sprang from her lips. Look, all these years I've never disobeyed your orders. I've always lived by the rules. I've never asked for anything. Yet when this daughter of yours, she's no sister of mine, by the way, not anymore. When she comes home after squandering your property and living a detestable life, you kill the fattened calf for her. My daughter, the father says, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this sister of yours, yes, she is still your sister, was dead and is alive again. She was lost and is found. And there the story ends. Except, of course, that it can't end there. There is so much which has not yet happened and which somehow must happen. Like many of Jesus' stories, it leaves us with questions, perhaps more questions than answers. And I'm going to suggest some of the questions now which the father and his daughters and us might have to resolve. Questions which we will return to next Sunday, not necessarily expecting to have all the answers, but perhaps there will be some. Questions you might like to ponder this week. I've put them in five groups based on the five participants in the story. So firstly, the younger daughter. How is she now to live? Is there a place for her within the values and worldview of her father's house? 
How can she live there with the orientation and passions which first propelled her away to the city? What does hope and a future look like for her? And who's going to tell her about them? Do her longings point to something deeper still, which only a bigger story can make sense of? Who's going to help her discover that? Who's going to walk with her? The younger daughter. I said at the start that this is a story about a father. In what ways has the daughter, the younger daughter's view of her father, been inadequate? How is her relationship with him now different, or now, or sh- and now should it be different, from what it was before her rebellion? Is she going to communicate with him better now? And if she continues to open herself up to her father in vulnerability and faith, what might happen? What might have happened if she'd done that in the first place? Perhaps that's the crux of the story, the relationship with the father. And then there's the elder daughter. In what way are her her views of her father inadequate? And can the two sisters live together in their father's house? Or is that relationship doomed to failure? Will the elder daughter end up pushing her younger sister back towards the city with all its dangers? What would her father want her to do? And what about Jesus, the teller of a similar story, who himself went into a far country to give his life on a cross as a ransom for many? What might it mean for both of those daughters to take up their crosses and follow him? And what transforming things might the Holy Spirit be able and willing to do in their lives when they submit to him. And finally, what about us? Where are you and me in this story? Which sister do you identify most closely with? How might the Holy Spirit want to comfort you or disturb you? How might you reach out to a younger or an elder daughter this week or a son with compassion? So many questions. But for now, for now, for today, the important thing is that the younger daughter has come home. That is something to celebrate, even if there are going to be challenges to be faced down the line. Perhaps it's not always going to feel like home to her. Perhaps her presence at home will make home feel less homely for her big sister. And perhaps for their father, compassion will continue to be mixed somehow with pain. Perhaps these words of Paul may may be of particular significance to this family in the days to come. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident, and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight." We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due to us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Oops. That's the end of the story.
That's the end of what I'm going to say for today. But I want to end by saying, at one level, this is a story about sexuality. But at another level, this is a story for everybody who has in any way become alienated from their Heavenly Father. At one level, this is a story about anybody who behaves harshly or judgmentally towards those who are on their journey home. Let us hear God's words wherever we are. There is a younger sister and an older sister in all of us. I invite you to pray and to reflect on these things this week and to ask the Holy Spirit to open your hearts to what God might be saying. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer. In a minute, we're going to share communion together. An opportunity to remember Jesus and the cross, but an opportunity to welcome one another in and to recognize that for all our differences, for all our failings, God is calling us home. Dear God, we thank you for the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, how he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep who went astray, threw his loving arms around me, drew me back into the way. He will keep me till the river rolls its waters at my feet. He will bear me safely over, made by grace for glory meet. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory, gathered by the crystal sea. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this story, which you invite us to be part of. We thank you that you invite us to come home and to welcome others as they come home. Draw us in, we pray, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you went to the cross so that we could come home. Lord, we know there's more to talk about. There's more implications for how we then live, for how we go about doing church together. There's all sorts of issues, but I think the thing you want, I know the thing you want us to say to, the, to, to know this morning is that you long for us to come home and you long to wel us to welcome others on their way home. Help us, we pray, to be part of that story. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a song now, uh, a song in which, um, well, the language might seem a little bit odd. Oh, you come.